Good morning. Welcome to the live in person and live Zoom worship service of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Riverside. Thank you for joining us here in person and thank you for joining us remotely by Zoom, where we will continue the live streaming and posting these services on our YouTube channel for our virtual attendees. I'm Dinah Rowe, a member of the worship committee and I will be your worship associate today. Other members of the worship committee who you will hear from include Alec Peck singing our hymns. We welcome you to join us this morning with an open mind and an open heart and with muted electronic devices. We invite you to leave your worries and defenses at the door and trust that what happens in worship is inspiring and powerful. Today, together, we affirm that this day and our being together can make each of us braver, more compassionate, and wiser as we be begin a new day and a new week. Although our doors are open, the pandemic is not over. So while we are here, please keep your masks on and speak in normal tones. Our opening hymn this morning is number 97, Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child. For those in the sanctuary, as of this week, we can sing as the spirit moves us with our masks on. Please stand in body or spirit and join us in singing number 97, Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child. For our call to worship, you are welcome to read with me the mission statement at our church. Our mission is to foster a diverse religious community that celebrates life, affirms the individual, encourages spiritual growth and open thought, and works to advance social justice and environmental sustainability. Our speaker today is Pat Coander, and she will be reading and sharing a reading entitled Honoring Zen Master Tich Nhat Hanh by Marianne Schnall. Marianne Schnall is a widely 
publicized, published writer and interviewer whose writings and interviews have appeared in a variety of media outlets, including the Oprah Magazine, CNN.com, and the Huffington Post. She is the founder of What Will, what Will It Take Movements, Movements, a new platform that inspires, connects, educates, and encourages women everywhere to advance in all levels of leadership. She is also the co-founder and executive director of the women's website and nonprofit organization, feminist.com, as well as the co-founder of the environmental site, ecomall.com. She is the author of Daring to Be Ourselves, Influential Women Sharing Insights on Courage, Happiness, and Finding Your Own Voice, and What Will It Take to Make a Woman President? Conversations about women, leadership, and power. This sermon was adapted from an article published in UU World, the magazine of the Unitarian Universalist Association, which can be read online at uuworld.org. Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh is a global spiritual leader, poet, and Pacific peace activist revered around the world for his pioneer teachings on mindfulness, global ethics, and peace. Our own life has to be our message. Thich Nhat Hanh envisioned and engaged Buddhism that could respond directly to the needs of society. He was a prominent teacher and social activist in his home country before finding himself exiled for calling for peace. He has applied Buddhist insights to every aspect of society, including education, business, technology, and the environmental crisis. Thich Nhat Hanh has offered modern translations of key Buddhist texts and spoken out on a range of global issues. We have two lightings of sacred flames. The first is the occupied indigenous people's remembrance candle. The second is the lighting of our own chalice, the symbol of our faith. We walk upon the traditional territories of diverse and sovereign peoples, the original people of this land who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. This spot we occupied was first the sacred space of several groups of indigenous peoples, including the Kawea, the Cupeño and the Serrano. We, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, light this sacred flame as the stewards of this sacred and holy place. We are blessed with a space and opportunity to strive to live out our common principles to bring justice, equity, and compassion into our daily lives, to resist all that threatens the earth and her people, and to be part of the world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Let these thoughts carry us forth as we journey and worship together. Today's reading of our child sliding is for holy days on which we recall all the old stories by Dillman Baker Cerellis. For holy days on which we recall the old stories, we light the flame. For Passover, which reminds us of the courage and strength of those seeking freedom in the past, we light the flame. For Easter, which reminds us that love is a, our greatest challenge, challenge, we light the flame. For gathering today in this sacred place, we light the flame. For the opportunity to be together as a community, to remember the past, to plan for our future, and to be alive in our present. Thank you, Bill. We have a tradition at UUCR to welcome those who are visitors or perhaps returning after some time away. We know it can be uncomfortable to stand up and speak in front of others. And so I will now ask for a volunteer from someone who has been here 
a while to tell us your name and how you found out about our church. We ask you to step close to the mic and speak into it clearly and directly so everyone can hear. Anybody want to volunteer? Maggie? Oh, you will volunteer? Okay, Alex, Eddie. It's not really volunteering. Okay. <laughs> you, okay. Hi, my name is Alec, and I'm part of the worship committee. Uh, and it's been almost two years now since I came here to Riverside. Uh, and I was raised UU by my parents, uh, but I've really loved every part of the spirituality that I've been able to explore through UUism. Uh, and that's been a really guiding light uh, in my life. So I've been really thankful for that uh, for my entire life. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. And that's how it's been. If you're new here, a visitor or an old friend who's been away for a while, please raise your hand to stand and come to the mic in front of the pulpit. Is there someone, oh, is there anyone in here that would like to speak? Okay, you wanna come forward and say hi to us? Hello everyone, I'm Micah May. Um, I'm not a believer. Speak, speak closer. Oh, I'm Micah May. I'm not really a believer, but I'm here with my son. He's trying to figure out his own spirituality and I wanted to be there for his journey. So um, I'm here, I really like the message. So happy to be here, thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Anyone else want to come up, come forward? Okay. Your name? Hi, yeah. my name is Alejandro, but you can call as Alejandro May, but um, you can call me Alexander or Sasha for short. <laughs> I, um, I have come here because I don't know what, re what religion I am, but I am hoping to find out as I do not, as I do not know yet, but I hope to find out what religion I belong or what religion I belong to precisely. Thanks. Thank you. Is there someone online, Alec, that would like to, or Adam, that would like to, or we've got somebody else that wants to come forward. Okay, welcome. Uh, good morning, my name is JP. Um, I've been coming here for the past month or so, but I don't get up quite often just to introduce myself again. Um, I come here for an NA meeting on Wednesdays and uh, you know, I just really like a safe space to find kind of grow spiritually and you know, take an hour out of my week to you know, just sort of be at peace and contemplate the wonderful topics you, know, you bring to light you know, during the sermons and everything. So thank you. Take your mask off. Hello, <clears throat> my name is Ariana. My name is Ariana, and um, I basically came here off of what are the directors here invited me to come here. I also come here um, on Wednesdays for, for a meeting. Um, more so for the community, not really so much the meaning, but more importantly, the uh, reason why I'm here is because um, I've spent quite a few years in organized religion. As a matter of fact, my mother died in the church. I, I actually spent about 17 years with Set Free Fellowship Ministries. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that. And um, I was asked to resign. I, I, was, I was part of the music ministry, and I was asked to resign because of the path that my life chose. Uh, you know, that my life, my path changed to what they thought my path should be. And to come here and to, you know, I have this sense of you've got to devote something to, to our creator, you know, a Sabbath, something. And um, I was floating for a minute and then I actually heard this gentleman speak uh, here at the pulpit. And um, I, I thought to myself, wow, that, that's just like a physician explaining not so much, I think, I guess a religion, but for me, I don't have a religion. I have a relationship with, with you know, a higher power, so. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
Adam, is there anyone online like to speak up? No? Okay. For any of our guests, please join us for socializing and coffee hour after the service. We'd love to chat with you in the Parish Hall, where you can also find our visitor's book. If you haven't signed the visitor's book, please do so. Leave your name before you leave so we know you're here and leave your contact information if you want to know about an upcoming events. For those online, the best way to get added to the mailing list is to e email the church administrator at admin at uuchurchofriverside.org. Now there are a few announcements that we'd like to show. During the service, we will mention several websites, email addresses, and phone numbers. At the end of the service, we will leave up a slide with all this information on our website. Last week, the CDC had updated the COVID framework to capture what they call COVID-19 community levels. These changes reflected, reflect the decreased risk of severe illness and death due to vaccines. This new CDC framework and its recommendations prioritize reducing severe illness and the strain on healthcare systems. According to the data from COVID Act Now, California and the County of Riverside are at a low risk community level. Use of a mask in store, indoors is strongly recommended, even for fully vaccinated individuals. You can make a vac an appointment at vaccine.ca.gov or for more information and more options of vaccine locations, go to covid19.ca.gov. Let's all take personal responsibility to protect ourselves and others. We are all in this together. Vasket, vaxit and mask it. Further announcements, don't forget to join us next week after the service for the first Sunday lunch. Next week, luncheon will be Mexican favorites and tacos. The family barbecue, which was scheduled for May 21st, is being moved to Memorial Day, Monday, May 30th. Tickets are pre-sale only. Next week is our UU flower communion. Please bring a couple flowers to share in the joy of spring and fellowship. Of course, extra flowers will be available so you don't need to bring one to participate. Our hymn now is number 1064, Blue Boat Home. If you are in the sanctuary, as of this week, we can sing as the spirit moves us with masks on. Please stand in body or spirit and join us in singing number 1064, and that's in the blue hymnals.
This portion of our service is to support our beloved historical church. This can be done and can be accomplished in several ways. In addition to the weekly collection, you may send your church your checks to the church address, which is shown here. You may contribute by PayPal using the QR code, which is on the church website and also in the newsletter. Stater Brothers Market gives our church a rebate on Stater grocery cards which we will have in church each Sunday. You get the full value and the church receives a percentage. Please donate as the spirit moves you by whatever method it works best for you. Thank you for ge your generosity and to those who give it their time and their talent. Thank you for your generous care and attention. Will our ushers come forward now to receive the collection? Our next hymn is number 402, From You I Receive. Please stand in body or spirit and join us in singing number 402, From You I Receive. Our meditation today is by John Corrado. Here we are, children at the big party, having our moment in the sun, our piece of the action, till our bodies give way and we are called home. We're one big, not always happy family, given life and breath by an eternal parent. We dearly long to know. Now we have one, our one shot at it, our one time to be a conscious part of this ongoing cavalcade. It's not a free and easy trip. We have to live with pain as well as pleasure. Temptation as well as promise. Loneliness as well as love. Fear as well as hope. We have to live inside a coat of skin wrapped up in drives difficult to control 
and dreams difficult to achieve. And though we are the guests of honor, we don't get to set the time of the party or its place, nor are we consulted about the guest list. This is our time, and there really is just one question. What are we going to do with this? Now let's pause for a moment of silence. Now I would like to introduce Pat Kowinder, reading Mary Anishnall's article, Honoring Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh. Good morning. I'm really honored to be here, and I'm delighted to talk about Thich Nhat Hanh, who has been an inspiration for many of us for many years. He, um, uh, during the Vietnam War, he protested, he was one of the few people that was courageous enough in Vietnam to protest, and he was very effective. He helped convince Martin Luther King to come out, speak out against the war which was a really good thing. He also wrote a wonderful book about anger. If anybody's struggling with anger, his, his book is just called Anger is, is excellent. I have a copy. My copy is falling apart from overuse, but if anybody wanted to borrow it, you could. It's really impressive. Um, I am, this is a new iPad and I can't remember how to do stuff on it. And so you're going to have to wait a minute while I get organized, and I apologize. Um, you, you know what? You could meditate. <laughs> Sorry, it'll take me a minute. OK, so this is the article that was in UU World about meditation and relaxation. And this, these are Thich Nhat Hanh's words. Um, Marianne Schnall asked him, what effects do you see on your daily life regarding your relaxation and meditation practices? And he responds, the therapeutic power of meditation is very great as modern scientific studies are now showing. The practice of mindful breathing, sitting meditation and walking meditation release tensions in the body and also in the mind. When we give ourselves the chance to let go of our tension, the body's natural capacity to heal itself can begin to work. Animals in the forest know this. When they get wounded, ill, or overtired, they know what to do. They find a quiet place and lie down to rest. They don't go chasing after food or other animals. They just rest. After some days of resting quietly, they are healed and they resume their activities. We humans have lost the wisdom of genuinely resting and relaxing. We worry too much. We don't allow our bodies to heal and we don't allow our minds and hearts to heal. Meditation can help us embrace our worries, our fear, our anger, and that is very healing. We let our own natural capacity of healing do the work. 
Total relaxation is the secret to enjoying sitting meditation. I sit with my spine upright, but not rigid. And I relax all the muscles in my body. Breathing in, I bring my attention to one part of my body, breathing out. I smile with gratitude and love to that part of my body. For example, I breathe in and I bring my attention to my face. On my face, there are about 300 muscles. And whenever I get worried, angry, or sad, these 300 muscles harden. And anyone who looks at me can see that I'm tense. But if while breathing in, I can be aware of my face, and breathing out, I can smile to my face, then the tension immediately dissipates. It's almost like a miracle. In just a few breaths, we can feel peace, happiness, and relaxation on our face. Our face becomes light, fresh, like the kind of flower it was before. Every face is a flower. After breathing three or more times with breathing in, I am aware of my face. Breathing out, I smile to my face. Then I can breathe in and bring my awareness to the muscles in my shoulders because our shoulder muscles are often tense. As I breathe out, I relax and smile with my shoulders. Gradually, we can move through the whole body. So after just a few minutes, we can already normalize our body so that it feels light and relaxed. This is something everyone can do in the first minutes of sitting, and not only when we are in the meditation hall. Wherever we sit, we can sit beautifully, just like we are sitting during, doing during sitting meditation, and we will feel stability and freedom. Sitting down to eat or do paperwork we sit upright and relaxed. Let us sit like the Buddha. I know some members of Congress who practice walking meditation on Capitol Hill. One of them says that when he goes to the floor to vote, he always practices walking meditation, stopping his thinking completely. His office is very busy. Every day he has to answer many questions. <clears throat> excuse me, to deal with so many different things. So the only time during the day when he can really stop his thinking and get a rest is when he goes out to cast a vote. He focuses his mind entirely on his breathing and on his steps, not thinking at all. And he says it helps him a lot to survive the hectic life as a congressman. It's very important that we learn the art of resting and relaxing. Not only does it help prevent the onset of many illnesses that develop through chronic tension and worrying, it allows us to clear our minds, focus, and find creative solutions to problems. We will be more successful in all our endeavors if we can let go of the habit of running all the time and take little pauses to relax and recenter ourselves. And we'll also have a lot more joy in living. The interviewer's next question was, what do you think the effects are on people who feel they're having relaxing time using electronics, that is computers, the TV or tweeting? His response was, this reminds me of something I've noticed with people going on vacations. The purpose of a vacation is to have time to rest, but many of us, even when we go on vacation, don't know how to rest. We may even come back more tired than before we left. What's that about? Relaxation is essential for our physical, mental, emotional, and relational well being. Because it's so important, I encourage the listeners to check in with themselves before and after they engage in activities that they do for fun and relaxation and see whether or not they actually feel better or more relaxed after the activity than they did before. 
then they can experiment with sitting meditation, walking meditation, or total relaxation practices and see how they feel after those. Her next question was, a lot of times when we feel we are relaxing, our mind is very busy. How can we become aware of this tendency and prevent our minds from taking over? His response, awareness of the activities of our mind is key. Everything begins with our mind. In our plum village monasteries, when our minds are dispersed and we hear the sound of the temple bell, we stop our talking, stop our thinking, and stop being dispersed. We come back to our breathing, to the here and now, and we get back in touch with what's happening in our mind as well as our body. We become alive and real again, not robots running around mindlessly. And we know what to do and what not to do in that moment. For example, if we're about to eat something unhealthy, the bell gives us another chance to pause and reconsider. If we're busily thinking about how irritated we are at someone, we can stop, become aware of our emotions, look more deeply into the situation, and find a more productive way to deal with it. Her next question was, people often say they're too busy for relaxation time. What simple techniques would you offer to them? His response, we don't have to schedule a trip to the monastery to enjoy the benefits of stopping for bells of mindfulness. We can use many ordinary events in our lives to call ourselves back to ourselves into the present moment. The ringing of the telephone, for example, Many of my students pause to breathe three long, slow, deep breaths before they answer the phone. In order to be fully present to themselves and to the person calling. Or when we're driving, a red light can be a wonderful friend, reminding us to stop, relax, let go of discouraging thought patterns, and feel more space inside. Taking five minutes to play with children or animals, to walk outside and look at clouds or wildflowers, enjoy our breathing. We can already release a lot of tension, relax and refresh ourselves. Identify your own favorite bells of mindfulness and let them remind you to enjoy being alive. He then mentions a, short, a book that he's written to help with that, it's called Peace in Every Breath, Daily Practices for Our Busy Lives. What is your concern for the, quest for the children growing up being so tethered to electronics? His response was, there are a number of scientific studies showing the negative effects of this. I've seen that one of the biggest drawbacks to relying on electronics as a primary refuge, the place we go to be entertained to feel good, is that we end up feeling not happier, but actually less happy. Electronics can be a constructive tool when used mindfully, but so often we use electronic media and games to distract ourselves from uncomfortable feelings like anxiety, depression, anger, loneliness, boredom, etc. We use media in an attempt to cover up the painful feelings inside us to fill up the void, the feeling of a void in our lives. What happens when we habitually run away from what's going on inside us and in our relationships, though, is that we end up becoming even more alienated and sad. A lot of TV shows, music, and games out there can be quite toxic, watering seeds of craving, fear, and violence in us. Yes, life and relationships can be challenging at times, but the more we habitually rely on electronics, just as with drugs or mindless eating, to numb ourselves to what's happening, the more our problems will persist and proliferate. That's not to say that we should sit around obsessing and ruminating over our problems either. Meditation, sitting quietly, calming the activities of our body and mind, and enjoying feeling our aliveness as the breath moves in and out is the most effective way to clear our mind and make a breakthrough in whatever places we're feeling stuck. 
Marianne's next question was, what do you think the effect would be in our society if a larger percent of people would actually take time for meditation and relaxation? And he responded, it's plain to see that there's too much violence, poverty, and suffering all around us. But we think we're too small and powerless to make any difference in these things. Maybe there's suffering right here in our own family. Maybe a family member is in so much pain that one day he or she will end up in a desperate situation of drug addiction or violent crime. We tell ourselves we don't know how to help that person and we have our own busy lives to lead. What is it we're so busy with exactly? For many of us, it's working to pay for the fancy diploma, the new car, the bigger house, the exotic vacation. When we take time for relaxation and meditation and turn off the constant drumbeat of advertising we're being, we've been inviting into our home, we find we actually need very little to be happy. We already have so many conditions for happiness that cost us nothing at all. Just take our eyes, for example. Our eyes are miraculous. They're like a pair of jewels. We only need to open them to see the blue sky, fluffy white clouds, beautiful flowers, the faces of our loved ones, or our ears. Anytime we like, we can take in the sound of inspiring music, of bird songs, of a burgling stream, of the wind whistling through pine trees. These are wonders of life, accessible to us at any moment through our eyes and ears. Our body is still healthy, our legs are healthy, and there are wonders in our very own body. Can we find fulfillment on these cost, costless joys and live more simply so we have time to listen deeply to those close to us or write a letter to our senator? When we wake up, when we become aware of what's going on and see what we really need to do and not do, this easily can bring major changes to our personal lives and also to our entire society. In fact, I don't know what else can. When people's bodies and minds are relaxed, they're much less likely to speak or act in violent ways. We also can access many insights and a wellspring of energy we haven't had since childhood. Women and men throughout history have accomplished seemingly impossible things. The truth is, there's no limit to the positive changes we can make for ourselves and for our society through mindfulness meditation. We just need to begin where we are, right here, right now. How can we balance being engaged with the world while nurturing our own, our inner life? Thich Nhat Hanh's response. We must be willing to challenge the assumption that time spent in relaxation and meditation takes away from our realizing other goals, such as a successful career or successful relationships. My own experience and that of my students has been that, as paradoxical as it might seem, when we take time for meditation, we actually gain in the other areas of our lives. For example, in our work life, one really innovative idea can make a huge difference to our bottom line, whether we're selling vacuum cleaners, writing legal briefs, or reducing sick days or other losses of resources. In relationships, both at work and at home, having a relaxed, spacious, alert presence allows us to refrain from saying the fiery words that first pop into our minds when we get angry. Relationships are like a forest. It takes a long time to build up precious trust, but one really thoughtless act or remark can be like a lighted match that destroys everything. Those of us who practice have seen very clearly that meditation and relaxation are the most effective ways of promoting creative, innovative thinking, intelligent choices, success, and satisfaction in all areas of our lives. That's the end of his talk. And what I invite you to do now is to have a little experiential part where you attempt to spend a few minutes in mindful meditation. Um, many people have told me that 
They can't meditate. It just doesn't work for them. And then they tell me what they do, that they sit and try to clear their mind. That doesn't work. Your mind is not, it doesn't respond to commands. It just doesn't. And you're just asking for frustration if that's what you try to do. When we meditate in mindfulness, all you do is turn your awareness to breathing. And if you, let me back up. Naturally, once you do that, you're focusing on your breathing, in a matter of seconds or minutes, you'll, something else will pop up in your mind. And that's natural. Many people, when that happens, they get frustrated, but that's natural. That's what the mind does. Thoughts bubble up like bubbles in a pond. That's just natural. And all you do is when you become aware that you're not focused on the breathing, you gently turn your awareness back to your breathing. I love the phrase, with grandmotherly kindness. In other words, you don't beat yourself up. Oh, I'm messing up again. No, that's not right. You're just meditating and it's a natural process. And usually at the beginning of meditation, there'll be lots of distraction, lots of pop things popping up. But the longer you do it, the more frequently you do it, the more readily you can turn your mind back to your breathing. And that's the goal. And you'll do it a million times. And that's, that's meditation. That's not, um, people feel like they haven't done it correctly if they don't <clears throat> experience deep peace. No, you're not, well, at least I don't experience deep peace. Um, what I experience is though, a kind of clarity that's really nice. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, also lately, I've been noticing that I love order. And given that I have chaos everywhere, it's a really good thing to know that I'm going to appreciate if I take the time to, to uh, put things away and clean up generally. So um, what I'm going to invite you to do in a few minutes um, Adam's going to play a, um, the chant of the Plum Village uh, meditators of, uh, this is Thich Nhat Hanh's people, and many people have an emotional reaction to this, and don't worry about it if you do, that's natural. Um, anyway, and we'll meditate first time for like three minutes, and all I ask you to do is to sit comfortably, spine straight but not rigid, and relax. Think about, you know, the, enjoying this. Don't make this hard. And um, just be aware of your breathing and just turn your attention back to your breathing when you realize you're not focused on your breathing. And the bell will ring. I don't know how I'm going to ring a bell. Oh, there. Ha. There's a bell. And, and um, I'll ring a bell at the end. And we'll start now. So I invite you, and, and of course, this is voluntary.
That was four minutes because I wanted more of the chanting. So did anybody experience, did anybody have times when they were focused on their breathing? Anybody? Oh, good, yeah. And did you have thoughts? Yeah, yep. <laughs> That's good meditation. That's very good. Did anybody enjoy it? Very good. Okay. Well, that's meditation. Um, the research is five minutes a day for eight weeks will change your life. It physically rewires the brain. So it's an amazing thing. And many people have tried and, and you know, have gotten out of the habit or whatever, but I invite you to go back to it because five minutes a day to change your life, maybe, we'll see. Okay, that's it for me, and I thank you very much for your attention. There are two iPads here. What did I do? Oh, you're okay, okay, but. Yeah. One of them stays up here. Whichever one is not yours. Which one's yours? Thank you, Pat. Our closing hymn is number 95. There is more love somewhere. Those in the sanctuary, as if this week, we can sing in the as the spirit moves us with masks on. Please stand in body or spirit and join us in seeing number 95. There is more love somewhere. There is more love somewhere. There is more love somewhere. Our benediction today. May we hear the melody of life and find ourselves singing harmony. May we be open to the dissonances in the song of the land and its people. May we be part of the world's urging towards justice, peace, and love. May we feel in our bones the rhythms of life and the land and find ourselves dancing. Namaste, amen, and blessed be. Thank you, Pat.
for sharing this article from UU World with us this morning. It is sincerely appreciated and we look forward to seeing you again. We're going to have about a 10 to 15 minute discussion following the service to share our thoughts on today's subject. Be aware this will be included on the video that is posted. Well, I will help uh, lead the discussion, uh, unless Pat, you want to lead it? Sure. Uh, well, in, in that case, I had a couple comments. There were a few things that really resonated with me. And thank you very much for sharing uh, that. I really enjoyed that. Um, and I thought that uh, when you were talking about, uh, or when uh, Taknat Han, right, uh, was talking about the need for resting to physically heal our bodies. I was thinking as well about mental health and how I was thinking about that exact same thing. As a physicist, most of my job involves just sitting around and thinking. Uh, and so, and I have the same experience that being very intentional about taking a break to stop working and clear your mind intentionally of, of in my case, you know, the work of physics, uh, and clearing that entirely from my mind ends up making it more efficient in the long run and also more enjoyable. Uh, I can get my work done faster if instead of just trying to plow through it, if I take some time and intentionally rest and, uh, and take some time. And I also really liked uh, what he had said about how every moment when we're just sitting around, uh, we can, that in itself is a time to sit and be beautiful. Uh, because, and I really like that because uh, I, I feel like, uh, you know, to put, I, uh, you know, it's sort of like every, every moment is an opportunity to feel that connection to, to the divine or, or to spirituality. Like it is, you don't need to do a complicated ritual. You don't need to go to a church and, and say the right things and do the right things. It is easy as just in that moment, you can find that direct connection to God or whatever it is you believe in. Very good, yes. Yeah, good, good comments. Does Buddhism have a strong tradition of lucid dreaming? If, uh, if part of what we're doing is clearing our minds and sometimes we're letting images and such like come into our mind. Would that lead possibly to lucid dreaming? I, I know that in uh, 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 pagan traditions, a lot of the time there's some emphasis that's uh, put in on that, but I didn't know if that was necessarily the same thing with uh, 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 with Buddhism. I uh, don't, I, I'm not sure. I've done um, like 15 day silent retreats at the monastery and people report that after the third or fourth day, yeah. lucid dreaming. But so I would imagine it would happen naturally in the monasteries for people who spend 40 years, but maybe not, maybe it all calms down. The lucid dreaming can work uh, effectively as well, because sometimes as humans, we're both looking at the world which is, but we're also looking, uh, we've self-loaded ourselves into various roles, archetypes, if you will, uh, and you can sit there and say, wait a second, I just got dissed by my own bloody dream. The <laughs> hell with that? I've actually gone back into dream state and said, you fix this. I'm the, I'm the freaking uh, 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 person that you're going to be, that you're selling this to. You will fix this. It's a mad smack about me, and I'm not letting this one go. And if you want to sit there and play games where you get to insult me in my dreams, I'm going to reach in there and I'm going to uh, let, grab a large handful of dream stuff and you're going to not like me uh, like when I play Plato. <laughs> you know, it's not always nice in silence. <laughs> and sometimes it's a good idea to sit there. And, you know, when you, if you're operating on a more, you know, hey, I wouldn't have done that to you. Don't you do that to me. It can be, it can be useful as well. There's a certain amount of passion that does get tucked away up in the dream line because we're all walking wounded. And uh, I was wondering, like I said, I, I wondered about that aspect. 
Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't really know, but you could Google it like we Google everything. Yeah. Are there times when you meditated where it's just been you found wells of anger? Oh yeah, yes, yeah. Actually, one time I was up in the monastery and I was doing Tai Chi, yeah. and I was stamping my feet. I was like, "Wait a minute, what's going on?" Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes, Grace. what is a normal state of mind so when we're asked to meditate it's hard for us because our minds are constantly coming up with thoughts as you said mm -hmm. um is that a normal state when we're awake to look for things to be conscious of is that why it's so hard to slow it down i i think i'm a psychologist um i think that um the brain naturally um is active and it, after three or four days of silent retreat there will be long periods in the meditation hall where i don't have thoughts and that's just a kind of bliss you know and then people have bliss experiences um but I think I think it's partly that our minds don't get to rest. And there's always, well, if you're worrying, there's always stuff coming up about what you could do or what's wrong or, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. So in a way, it's like training your mind to rest. Um, yes. Yeah. But it's, it's allowing it. it. It will do it naturally if you give it a chance. If you, by focusing on the breathing which is always there, you know, you can do it on a train, on a bus, you can do it anywhere. Yeah. And um, the more you do it, the more it becomes, uh, it, it will come up naturally sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. And I know physically, if you don't rest, at some point you're gonna collapse because right. your body is gonna force you to yes. rest. So I wonder if that's the same mentally as well. I don't think your mind ever quits. I think it needs you to direct, you know, and that's what's so great about meditation, mm -hmm. that it's, it, it's you, you allowing the mind to heal itself. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. I won't be able to hear you unless you pull your mask down. Hi, Pat. Uh, I wanted to help you ask partially answer. Oh, sure. Grace yeah, and please. Bill's questions. Um, meditation and the clearing of the mind in the Buddhist tradition. Um, there's this attempt to achieve nirvana, whatever that is. Nobody's really ever answered. Maybe Pat can has heard more about it. Nobody's really <laughs> answered exactly what nirvana is. Nobody knows. But according to the Buddha, it's something that is achievable. It just takes a long time and masterful works. But the point is with meditation is to clear the mind, stop the monkey chatter, stop the random thoughts, and your mind just becomes still. And my experience, I've, I've experienced that state a couple of times. It takes a long time to do that. But what happens is, and my thoughts of what nirvana achieves is a long period of stilling your mind after lots of practice your mind is stopped it is still there are no thoughts there's no lucid dreaming and at some point with your mind still and no thoughts you become wide open to the universe and that may be what the buddha was talking about with nirvana but it's a complete stillness of all thought, all random thoughts. And at some point you enlarge to something, you're open to the universe and, and larger than yourself. Hope that helped. Yes, yeah, it did. Um, yeah, and I should mention, I remember people reporting at these meditation retreats, um, that incredible sense, there is no other. We are all one. They experience it. They don't think it, they feel it. They, 
they learn it, they, they know it from then on. Thank you, I really, I really like that response. And I really liked as well what you had to say, Pat, and I also wanted to uh, contribute to that. Uh, I, I think that is that in terms of going back to Grace's question, what is that natural state in that for me, meditation is about recognizing, as you said, Pat, our breathing is always there. Uh, and so it, it turns out that that is our natural state. We do have all of these processes that we can't control. Uh, our breathing is the most noticeable one, but all of our muscles are constantly firing completely out of our control. And part of meditation for me is recognizing that even as I'm just sitting there, my stomach is digesting and, and gurgling and all of these things are happening and all of that is coming from my brain. And as, and as you pointed out, coming to peace with the universe kind of means sort of renormalizing your perspective and saying all that noise, that's actually not noise. That's just what it feels like to be alive. That's just what it means to be yeah. part of the universe. Yeah, that's lovely, yep. I really appreciate your questions and discussion. Um, I'm just an advocate of meditation. I think it, it would change the world. 50% of the humans on the planet would meditate. All our problems would disappear, I think. Um, I have a meditation class here at the church on Thursday mornings at 10. It used to be at nine, but some of us have trouble getting up. So it's now at 10 o'clock, but you're invited to attend um, anytime. And, we talk and we share insights, I think. Um, so, anything else? Thank you all very much. <laughs>